2,000. We have no idea, but tradition, it's extra biblical tradition, says three. That, that, that means that it's not in the Bible. So hymns like We Three Kings of Orientar, it's very strange. Orientar is not a place. That's the first line of the song. It's Orient, R, right? Um, but in any case, not only that, but we don't know that there are three kings. So there's two very funny things about that title. In any case, keep singing it. No one will get mad at you. But they're looking for a king of the Jews. This would be particularly troubling to an existing king of the Jews by the name of Herod. Here come kings from another land looking. They come to Herod, the king of the Jews, and they say to him, we are here seeking the newborn king of the Jews. Can you imagine? <laughs> Herod probably didn't think, oh, oh, good. That's fantastic. There's a new king of the Jews. Although he probably would have thought that he had many, many, many sons somewhere. He was not a virtuous man. He had many women in his life. And he would just as soon put them out of his life and the sons they bore to him if they caused him any, any concern. He killed many, many former girlfriends, concubines, and many wives and their sons for fear that he would lose his kingdom to them. Isn't that something? And so when you come to the king of the Jews, and then there's this idea of the stars. How do three or more, two or more wise men know that there's a star that would start showing in the sky sometime in accordance with the birth of a new king. A couple ideas. Maybe they were with Daniel in Babylonia and they learned about the stars. Perhaps they were like Job and they learned the gospel from the stars in the sky. Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament displays his handiwork. You might know this. The signs of Aquarius were the signs of the gospel a long time before they started directing spiritists to some kind of strange fortune telling. They told the story of the lion that would be born of a virgin and crush a dragon. Let there be no doubt in your mind that the Lord God of heaven designed the heavens after his son and not after your fortune. Do not be intimidated. Do not be set on your back heels as if you should know something. The other possibility from the stars, the other possibility is that these wise men knew the book of Numbers. It's possible they came from as close east as Jordan. And as you might know, there was a Balaamite prophet by the name of Balaam who actually said that there would be a star that would arise out of Jacob there in Numbers 24. There are many reasons why these wise men would have thought that a new king was being born. And what of the star? How in the world is a star so big that it can be shown in the night sky and seen from the east and so small that it can stand over a house and yet so strange that it can disappear for a while? If it had not disappeared, they would not have come to see Herod. Is that not correct? It says that it appeared again and guided them to the place where the child was. Well, there's a couple possibilities. Some have said, and there are many guesses, that it really was a new star that was formed. And then you'd have to question, how is it possible that it disappeared? It's possible that it disappeared behind the horizon just long enough. And that when they looked off into the horizon and saw the star right over the place where Jesus was, it was just simply a star on the horizon from their perspective in Jerusalem, and they look off to the horizon towards Bethlehem, and there's a star on the horizon, and they follow the horizon to get to the right town and then to the right house. Could be. So we don't have to be, we, we don't have to come up with zany theories, like, well, it was an angel, and it, it just stood over the house and took a lunch break while they were seeing Herod. Um, there are other good things. But since this is not Sunday school, and since I'm not here to tickle your brain necessarily, we will keep reading. In verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And we talked about why he would be troubled, brothers and sisters. He would be troubled because he's the king of the Jews. He is the one who is the king of the Jews. And so why would Jerusalem be troubled with him in verse number 3? Jerusalem will be troubled with him in verse number 3 because if Herod is going to go on a killing spree again, because he's suspicious of another 
king being born in his stead, then Jerusalem doesn't want to be anywhere around. And they have good reason. Once you look forward in the passage, he in fact does go on a killing spree. But another reason Jerusalem might have been upset is because it might have meant that someone worse than his dad might have shown up. Someone worse than King Herod the Great might come. And that would cause Jerusalem to be troubled. But I think that maybe troubled is just a tad more simple than that. The town was agitated. Why were they agitated? Because all of these foreigners that don't look like they're from here have come in such a vast number, and they're asking where the palace is, and they have heralds before them, and they have guards around them, and they have trailers to their rear, and they have leaders to the front, and guards to their right and left. This could have been as many as one or 2,000 people coming in the gates of Jerusalem. So why would Jerusalem be troubled? Well, if you're tending the gate and a couple thousand extra people show up in your town, it might cause you to be troubled as well. And here they are bothered. And so in verse number 3, Herod heard this. He was troubled. Verse 4, he gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together. He inquired of them where Christ was to be born. So Herod says, let's see if any of their prophets know where this new king is going to be born. And they found a prophet that knew a scripture. I wonder, brothers and sisters, if someone asks you a question in your workplace, are you able to find a scripture? I'll just let that one sit there a minute. Verse 5, they said to him, and now we're quoting, In Bethlehem of Judah, for thus it is written in by the prophet, and they're quoting Micah, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who shall shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them that what time the star appeared. And we get a kind of an idea that they're going to tell him that the star appeared a couple of years ago, maybe. Why? Because he kills all the baby boys two years old and under. So there's a good idea here that this wise men's visit, these wise men visit Jesus long after he's an infant, possibly on a return trip of Joseph and his family to Jerusalem area, specifically Bethlehem. Now, that will trouble you if you're not careful. Because all of a sudden, you're like, man, i got to go home and run home and change the nativity scene in my front yard. No, you don't. No, you don't. It'll be okay. We can actually disagree on the timing of the wise men's visit, but I did want you to be aware so that, especially you seniors in high school, when you go off to your secular college next year, and a Bart Ehrman type at UNC Chapel Hill says, look at Matthew, look at Luke, they disagree. Obviously, your Bible has contradictions. Well, I didn't put 23 years of reading my Bible every day in my life and get the degrees I've got and taken the calling that I've called because I thought that the Scripture was hard. The reality is the Bible does have apparent issues, but they are apparent issues only. They are not at all contradictions. And Matthew and Luke can be well harmonized, but that's not the point of the passage this morning. I wanted you to see that there's a hint in the text that this could be up to two years after Jesus' birth, maybe two years after his conception. In either case, In verse number 7, Herod inquired. In verse 8, he sent them, the wise men, to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you found him, bring him back to me. Bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed. Behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them. Now, here it is. It appears. The star is now visible again until it came and stood over where the young child was. Imagine a star moving along the horizon, quite possibly, and as they're moving towards Bethlehem, their movement along with the star's movement on the horizon, the star rests over just above the horizon, the place where they would find the Christ child. It's one explanation. It's a possibility. Yes, I realize the star could be so large they saw it from the east, and then somehow miraculously so small that they could follow this little light Above the house. I get that. But I I think there are other explanations. Verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. House, young child. There's a couple more hints, right? And uh, they fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him. Gold, frankincense, 
and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream they should not return to Herod, they departed from their own country another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. Now please, in verse number 15, 16, you notice that Herod is angry when he sees that he's deceived by the wise men who heard in a dream that they should not go back to Jerusalem. And he kills, in verse number 16, children, male children, in the Bethlehem district from two years old and under. All of them! But then he quotes another prophet, the prophet Jeremiah, in verse 18. Verse 19, when Herod was dead... An angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Arise, take your young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the young child's life are dead. This is the word of the Lord. And you're in a room full of people that believe every word. Every word of God is true. And we believe it. I know it's dark in here. I promise it's the cloud cover. We've got every bit of these light bulbs turned on that we have in here. So I hope you'll forgive us today. I know some of you are having a difficult time making it out in here. And uh, so I will promise you that one of my first uh, one of my first desires is to get brighter lights in here. So in any case, there you have it. I want to just point out a few things, as, if we could. Number one, please notice in this chapter that the lust that mankind has for notoriety has not changed. Brothers and sisters of Sandy Ridge Baptist Church, week after week, I try to stress to you time and again that God doesn't change and you can trust his character. Can I just say to you also, it is just as reliable that mankind does not change. And they still hate God and they still love to be noticed and worshipped. Herod's issue in this entire story is that he wanted to be the only king that was adored. Let me say it again. He wanted to be the only king that was adored. That is a real issue. I suppose we should also point out in passing and quickly the significance of small things in the life of God. You see, you and I are part of his story. His story. It's a grand story, isn't it? And everything that God does, no matter how seemingly insignificant, is of utmost importance. There are no lost details in the plan of God. None at all. How do I get that out of the passage? It is no mistaking that the town of Bethlehem was a shock to many in that audience that day. They would not have expected Jesus to be born in Bethlehem. Obviously, they expected Jesus to be somewhere around Jerusalem. Why? Because that's where kings live. Do you follow that? Thirdly, God speaks in dreams 2, 3, and 4 in this chapter. He speaks to Joseph to go to Egypt. He speaks to the wise men to not return to Jerusalem. And he speaks to Joseph to return from Egypt. Four dreams altogether so far in this book of Matthew three of them in this chapter. In this chapter, four Old Testament prophets are quoted. Micah, Hosea, Jeremiah, and Isaiah. I want you also to notice, just in passing, that the last time we were expecting a deliverer in Israel's history is when Moses was being born in Egypt. Do you remember that? Do you remember, brothers and sisters, that Pharaoh was killing children when they were expecting a deliverer? Do you know that Herod, when he was expecting an enemy deliverer, was killing babies? And I want to just say that one of the greatest hints that we are close to the arrival of our deliverer is that they're killing our babies again in this land. 35, 3,600 innocent lives taken in abortion clinics all around this country every day. Brothers and sisters, mankind has not changed. And if you think that I think that there's not demonic influence behind abortion, just like there was in the days of Herod, and just like there was in the days of Pharaoh, you need to keep reading your Bible. It's clearly a pattern. might notice that there are two Josephs in the Bible, and both of them went to Egypt. might notice that Christ is better than Moses, because just as Moses came out of Egypt and brought deliverance to his people, So Jesus came out of Egypt and brought deliverance to his. Just some little nuggets, by the way, in the book of Matthew. But I'd like to just point out a couple things in this several minutes remaining. In this message entitled, Joseph Saved Jehovah. Joseph Saved Jehovah. You see, we would expect in a Christmas story 
that a man who is the subject and the title of a grand and glorious drama to be Jesus himself, and indeed he is a hero. But just how amazing is Jesus the Christ? He's so amazing. He's so amazing that he's willing to play along with an irony because of the will of his Father. Think about Matthew 1, 21. You'll call his name Jesus, Jehovah saves, because he will save his people from their sins. You can write down next to that verse, Psalm 102. The 102nd Psalm quotes a verse that is quoted by the Hebrews writer where Jesus Christ is called Jehovah. And you, Jehovah, in the beginning have laid the foundations of the earth and the world is the work of your hands you are of old but they shall perish you shall fold them up as a garment but thou art the same and thy years will not fail that's out of the hundred and second psalm and hebrews quotes that verse and says it's talking about jesus mark it down not every time when you find jehovah in the bible is it talking about god the son but there are times in the Bible when Jehovah is mentioned that it's talking about God the Son. And here in this verse, we find that in this chapter, in one chapter's time, you have Jesus being named something that means Jehovah saves, and then you have Jehovah being saved. It's quite strange. Joseph saved Jesus from Herod. Isn't it a miracle to think about the Creator being vulnerable? Did you just hear what I said? The Creator being vulnerable. That blows my mind. Here's what a songwriter wrote, Jesus, joy of the highest heaven, born as a little baby under a wondrous star. Like us, crying, he takes his first breath, held by his mother helpless, Close to her beating heart, Jesus laid in a lonely, lowly manger, facing a world of dangers, come to turn me, a stranger, into a child of God. Jesus, King of the highest heaven, learning to take his first steps that he might bring us life. That's marvelous. Or, came across the song this morning, maybe you've not heard it, so I'll sing a bar for you. Not sing in a bar for you, but sing it. It's a musical term. <laughs> Sounds of wonder fill the sky with the songs of angels as the mighty prince of life shelters in a stable. Hands that set each star in place shaped the earth in darkness. Cling now to a mother's breast, vulnerable and helpless. Think about that. Hands that flung each star in space shaped the earth in darkness, cling to a mother's breast, vulnerable and helpless. That's fantastic. I've been singing all week, what child is this? This is our God. How awesome. A God we serve. I'd like you to think about the idea that Joseph saved Jehovah from Herod out of Bethlehem, into Egypt, in Egypt, out of Egypt, out of, out of Egypt to Galilee, through Galilee to Nazareth. Joseph is instrumental in saving Jehovah, and some of you are still sucking air, wondering if you should tweet about me. You can't believe I'm saying something that the Bible says. Let me just go one step further. Joseph saved Jehovah from Satan. Matthew, Matt, Dr. Matt, would you please stand and read Revelation 12, 4 and 5 in your waiting room voice. Thank you. A dragon stood before the woman 
ready to devour the child as soon as it was born. Think about that. Who is behind that grand infanticide in Bethlehem? Satan. Joseph saved Jehovah from Satan. But we just heard in Revelation 12, 5, he was caught up by God into the heavens. So we could say that the Father used Joseph to save Jehovah from Satan. This is so doctrinal. I wanted to hear about the three whites. Stop it. You're okay. We can think deeply. You can think for just a moment about how a man was being used to save God. Now, that will start some conversations, and it'll probably end a few. <laughs> the father hid his son from Satan, but let's put it this way. The son trusted his father to protect him from Satan. Let me say that again. L let me say that again. The son trusted his father to protect him from Satan. I want you, Brother Rick, to stand and read Psalm 22.1 and then pause for me to make an obnoxious interjection. There you are, verse 1 of Psalm 22. Is there anyone doubting that that's talking about Jesus based on what Jesus prayed on the cross? All right, please stand and read verses 9 and 10, where Jesus is still talking. So here we are in Psalms, reading about the infancy of Jesus. Jesus said, Father, well, he starts out, why have you forsaken me? Then he builds a case for why he doesn't understand why his father forsook him on the cross. And he describes a time in his past when his father made him trust him while he was on Mary's bosom. Do you believe that? Jesus, the infant, was trusting his father. So while Joseph is carrying away Mama Mary and baby Jesus, it is Satan chasing Jesus, trying to extinguish yours and my salvation. I can't think about that. The hope of the whole world rests on a mule heading to Egypt. And Joseph is protecting that woman and moving quickly because God told him to. And it's God the Father the whole time moving him south to protect his son. And meanwhile, what's happening in the mind of that infant? He's trusting his father. <laughs> Are we learning today? The son trusted his father to protect him from Satan. And that is no mistake because two chapters later in this Gospel of Matthew, it is Satan tempting Jesus, and we find Jesus at just about 30 years old, and he is still putting a knot on Satan, still whipping his tail, and he's doing it by quoting the scripture. You and I, brothers and sisters, can defeat Satan by quoting scripture. The son trusted his father to keep him secure in a strange land. And it's even deeper than that. It's even deeper than that. It was strange enough to come to planet Earth. But then to go to a place called Egypt, the son is trusting his father through the hands of his earthly, earthly foster father, Joseph, to save him from the onslaught of Herod, who was really the worker of Satan at that moment, and all the while, it's happening in a very unsuspected place. Be instructed, brothers and sisters. God often brings deliverance in unassumed, unexpected places. If I were Jesus, I would have preferred to have been born in a palace and kept safe there behind royal guards 
but I would have made a horrible savior. You can say amen. <laughs> it's, tr it's true. <laughs> Can't even save myself putting up a garage door opener. So here are some marvels from all of this. Here are some takeaways. Number one, God uses people to accomplish things of eternal significance. God uses people to accomplish things of eternal significance. I don't know that Joseph knew everything that he was doing. But if Joseph was interested in having the entire story given to him, he might not have been such a willing, a willing participant in this wonderful drama. I wonder, brothers and sisters, I wonder how often Bill Sturm misses a blessing because I demand to know the end of the story right away. I wonder if I would still do everything I'm doing for the Lord if I knew that the end of the story included some rough, rough, rose to hoe. Joseph, a just man, is being used to accomplish, if you want to get down to it, the salvation of all mankind. And I'm not trying to, to, to canonize him, okay? By the way, that's a Catholic word. Joseph's as much a saint as I am or any pope was. He's a saved man. If you're a saved man or woman, you're a saint. So, you know, I don't know what to tell you about that, but Joseph needed a savior, but before he got his savior, he had to save his savior. How about it? There's no application there for us, brothers. There's nothing for us to do for Jesus to be who he is. He is exactly who he says he is, and he's exactly what he said he would be, and he's exactly, he will always be what he is claiming to be, and so much more, he'll not disappoint you. Number two, you can do, you can do what you ought to do. When you come away from this story, and you find a lady who was with child and traveled to Bethlehem, and you find a man who was being underestimated and misjudged named Joseph, it comes very clear to us that you can do what you ought to do. This, this should be the only zinger this week. This should, only, this should be the only zinger this week, brothers and sisters. So let's get it over with. Uh, you all with me? Okay, here we go. This is going to be hard on me, so just... Joseph probably didn't feel like going to Egypt. It was a long ways out of the way. And I suspect that we Christians could learn a little bit about enduring some hardness. I look over here and I see Sister Dorothy, <laughs> who lost her mother, and here she is worshiping with us. I see Sister Angie, Angela, Angela, not Angie. That's Angie, that's Angela. Dad fell this week. And she found it in herself to be here this morning. I am amazed a little bit about what we call toughness as Christians. I, oh, here we go. On Monday, if my wife is kind of sick, I still work. On Tuesday, if, if my little ones are sick and mama can take them to the doctor, I still work. Do you know where I'm going with this? I, on Sundays... Somehow, I know none of you ever do this, but somehow, if anyone has a hangnail, the whole house stays home. All right, moving on. Not only can you do what you ought to do, but you must only do what you must do. Don't let people bully you in your schedules. Brothers, if you don't want to sing with the men on New Year's Day, don't. Don't make me feel like you're less of a Christian if you don't do everything I say to do. Here is Joseph. The reason he went to Egypt is not because he wanted to, but because he had to. He was being instructed to do it. You must only do what you must do. Let God instruct us.